Congratulations on making it to this point in the semester, and congratulations to arriving to where many of historians, myself included, consider to be modern times. If you joined us the last time, you heard us wrapping up um, our business when it comes to World War I, the impact that World War I made on American life here at home. And I, I, I never really came out and said this, but I certainly laid some pretty heavy hints we are certainly headed as a society into much more conservative terrain and certainly you will see what I'm talking about here when we discuss the politics of the 1920s. Um, I like the 20s. I like the 20s a lot for a lot of reasons and one of which the 1920s is really the first modern decade and in so many ways it's really the first era that even really kind of recognizes itself as what you and I would think of as a decade. But there's a lot of things that define life in America in the 1920s. One would be our foreign policy. We returned to isolationism in the 20s, partly because of what a terrible taste that we had in our mouth when it comes to how World War I ended. You're also seeing an Americanization process. Now, some of this is going to be pretty natural, as you'll find out, probably not this time, but the next lecture I give. There's an Americanization process that involves what many of us call a mass culture. Um, there's also the, the darker side of the Americanization process, and that would be, I guess, bluntly put, vigilante groups that are more or less enforcing what they see as traditional American values. You see a business-government partnership that had really emerged during World War I. A lot of those firms that did very well for themselves during the war, they liked that and they wanted to continue on in that sort of relationship after the war. But if there was one thing that really characterized the 20s, it was this return to laissez-faire economics. The approach whereby the government essentially kept its hands off regulatory levers when it comes to the economy. Government stay out of the economy. You can't talk about the 20s and not talk about what the Republican Party is doing. And simply put, what the Republicans are doing is they're dominating. Okay. The 1920s would be characterized by back to back to back. Republican administrations, not just Republicans, conservative Republicans, beginning with the guy that you're looking at up there, if you're looking at that PowerPoint right there, he's the uh, taller gentleman on the right, that is a guy by the name of Warren uh, G. Harding. Um, Harding is one of my favorite presidents for so many reasons, but uh, since we're pressed for time, I'll only share one. Um, he would just invent words, right? He would invent words like vocalcating or uh, one of my favorites, he would say on his campaign trail that we're going to return to normalcy. But instead of really taking heavy criticism for really just sort of making up words in the English language, um, reporters looked around at the room and they, they looked at each other and they started whispering. And, and it was like he made you feel like you were the idiot for not knowing what the meaning of this word that he just made up was, right? He was very charming. He was very charismatic. He carried himself very, very well. His running mate is the guy that you see next to him, uh, a conservative governor from Massachusetts by the name of Calvin Coolidge, who could not have been any more different from Harding if he tried when it comes to personalities. More of that in a minute. The guys that they will run against are the ones at the bottom of the screen there. The guy uh, that is a little bit shorter, he's on the right, that's James Cox. He's going to be the Democratic nominee for president in 1920. And the guy that's a little bit taller with the, with the glasses on, that'd be the future president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, simply put, what happens to the Cox-Roosevelt ticket is it gets absolutely steamrolled. I'll come back to this slide in just a second, but I want you to take a quick look at my map. It's a pretty red map. I mean, the only place that the Democratic Party really matters would be the South. And if you look at those electoral returns, that's not really where the bulk of the votes are. The, the votes are in the Northeast.
They're the in, in the Midwestern industrial heartland. To a lesser extent, they're on the West Coast, and the, and the Democratic Party doesn't really matter very much out there. The Democratic Party throughout the 1920s is going to be the minority party. And as I said before, the only place that it really matters is the American South. But back to our Republican era story. Harding and his administration were beset by scandal. It was that classic adage, when the cat's away, the mice will play. I'm not saying that Harding himself was corrupt, but there were a lot of people that uh, left a lot to the imagination, if you understand what I mean, within his administration. And they took advantage of this hands-off, very loosely uh, governed sort of approach to regulating the economy. Well, if you're connecting the dots, you can see that this one's probably going to end in some sort of major scandal, and it does. The Teapot Dome scandal, beginning in 1922 and not settled until 1923. What the Teapot Dome scandal involved was the illegal leasing of oil fields, the ability to drill in the oil fields of the Elk Hills in Montana. I'm not really concerned that you know where these oil fields were. I just need you to understand that somebody within Harding's administration knowingly and consciously leased these fields to private drillers, which was patently illegal. Now, this is obviously going to bring a lot of pressure on Harding's administration, Harding himself. Harding wasn't old, per se, when he took the oath of office, but he was a bit of a party boy. He drank a lot. He smoked a lot. He liked to stay up late. He played on the, st on the stock market. And for all intents and purposes, um, this pressure combined with a very unhealthy lifestyle really took its toll. And in 1923, everything came crashing down and Harding died while he was in office, leaving Calvin Coolidge to take over for him. Now, as I said before, Calvin Coolidge was very different from a personality standpoint. He was from Massachusetts. He was one of those strong, silent Puritan types. And he didn't have the same kind of charm and charisma. He was really kind of um, lead from behind the scenes sort of approach. Um, but when it comes to their political philosophies, they were absolutely on the same page. If anything, Coolidge is more conservative than Hardy when it comes to government regulation of the economy. What Calvin Coolidge used to say is that there was really nothing better that a president could do for the American economy aside from nothing. Don't do anything. Don't get your nose involved in any way, shape, or form. That's when things go south. That's when they go badly. Um, he used to brag that no president before him or even after him, he predicted, would get as good and as much sleep as he did from doing nothing. He used to say that, he, that, that the chief business of the American people was business. The best thing that the president could do to that end was allow business owners like Henry Ford to run their factories as they knew how. Keep in mind, he's going to inherit this presidency. He doesn't win the presidency outright. But 1924 is an election year, and Coolidge is going to run. And if you're looking at that PowerPoint right now, you can see that, once again, we're talking about a very red map. But there is a little splotch of green up there. That green is in Wisconsin. And there's a very specific reason why it's Wisconsin. It's Robert Lafayette the one-time senator from the state of Wisconsin who was very involved in the progressive movement, very involved in progressive era reform. He was similar to Teddy Roosevelt in the sense that he felt that there ought to be a set of playing rules for businesses and corporations to play by, and if they stepped over the line, it was the job of the federal government to get them back in line. Well, the fact that Lafayette running on the Progressive Party ticket in 1924 is able to pull off um, a state in the Electoral College, that's a big deal. That's not nothing right there. And if nothing else, guys, what it does is it demonstrates that, yeah, it's a very red map, and sure, you know, we are talking about back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back Republican administrations, 
But the Electoral College can be pretty deceiving when it comes to the mood and uh, the, the, the sentiment of the American body politic. But it is true that Coolidge is going to win another four years of office. And his approach to allowing business to basically do whatever it needs to do to profit, it will have some short-term benefits. You do see the economy boom pretty heavily in those mid, and even mid to late 1920s. And then you're going to see some trouble on the horizon. Um, more of that as we round out our conversation of the 1920s. But for right now, I want to turn our attention away from politics and begin to talk about American society a little bit. 1920 is a really big year for American women because we passed the 19th Amendment, which gives the American women the right to vote. Um, now, we're a long, long time before the era of women like Hillary Clinton running for president. Um, the idea was you now have the right to vote, but you get to choose which man that you want to represent you. All that being said, you had organizations like the Women's Joint Congressional Committee that would caucus and apply pressure to mainstream male politicians, both Democrats and Republicans, to enact policies that were near and dear to the hearts of women. One such example, the Shepherd Towner Federal Maternity and Infancy Act of 1921. What this law was designed to do was put more federal dollars in the form of research into the hands of scientists, medical doctors, uh, researchers, people of that variety, and its whole point was to drive down infant mortality. That's a very fancy way of saying uh, babies dying and mothers dying in childbearing processes as well. This is pretty tame, this is pretty vanilla when it comes to its brand of politics, but it never sees the light of day. The American Medical Association really comes out strongly against Shepard Towner and describes it as socialized medicine. Now, we're not only talking about the Republican era, we're talking about a time period that comes right after the Red Scare, that deep-seated fear of communism that we were talking about the last time I had you, okay? You label anything socialistic, let alone communistic, and it is the kiss of death. You're not coming back from something like that. And the Shepherd Towner Act did not come back from that as well. So even though it was pretty, you know, uh, underwhelming when it comes to what it wanted to do, um, it never really moves forward, and it really does drive at the political sentiment of the country at that particular moment. But back to our story involving the economy, if you could boil down what's going on in the economy in the 1920s, business consolidations. Uh, let me give you one very good example that will kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about here. Um, once upon a time, there were dozens and dozens of American auto manufacturing companies. Uh, most of them you probably haven't ever heard of before. And the guy that uh, brings these companies, many of them anyway, together, you probably haven't heard of him either. He was a guy from Detroit by the name of Billy Durant. And what he did was he more or less consolidated um, a lot of these manufacturing companies into one gigantic behemoth of a corporation. He took Cadillac, he teamed it up with Studebaker, teamed that up with Buick, teamed that up with Oldsmobile, with Hudson. They developed a brand new uh, car that was uh, d meant to compete directly with Henry Ford's Ford Model T. Um, they called it the Chevrolet after the race, race car driver, who was also instrumental in the, um, in, in the design of the Chevrolet car, the, the everyman's car. And they called this massive uh, corporation, they called it General Motors. It was a lot of different corporations, manufacturing companies that are all under the umbrella of General Motors. And, and naturally, there were critics that said, what you are is you're a monopoly. You've got a monopoly going here. And Durant said, not so. Not only do I have to compete with Henry Ford and the Dodge brothers, but Oldsmobile's going to have to compete with Cadillac, who's going to have to compete with Packard, who's going to have to compete with Buick, and you can go right down the list. Okay. So 
this is a very good example as to what I'm talking about when it comes to business consolidations. It's also a time period that is hotly, hotly anti-union, okay? There are a number of different strategies that employers deploy to keep unions out of their factories. One of which is this concept known as welfare capitalism. Very simple definition. Be loyal to the company. You want workers to be loyal to the companies, okay? And the way that you get them to be loyal is you provide them with benefits. I don't mean 401ks or health insurance. What I'm really talking about would be, generally speaking, better pay. Um, a lot of these companies would sponsor picnics. They would sponsor softball teams. Uh, they would help you procure things like medical insurance, life insurance, paid vacations. In some cases, they would even go so far as to co-sign with you on a home loan. Okay, That's how you kept people loyal to the company so that they did not need to organize. There's another idea that's being floated around there during this period that there really isn't any need for unions, bands of workers, because we're dealing with this new capitalism. What new capitalism was really driving at was the idea that we had perfected the art of production, right? We'd perfected it so much that we're cranking out so much output that prices are falling precipitously. They're falling to ridiculously low rates when it comes to what you're paying for a car, what you're paying for a furnace, what you're par paying for a new pair of shoes or a new set of clothes. New capitalism um, insinuated that this art of the process of production was benefiting people at the lower ends of the economic ladder because they now they too, because their prices are so cheap, they too can afford to partake in this, what we might call middle class lifestyle. But there are a few people that we should probably mention when it comes to reinventing the wheel, no pun intended. The first one that I want to talk about is the man on the right there. That is um, Frederick Winslow Taylor. Um, if you had to describe Taylor, describe Taylor by our standards here today, I'd probably call him an engineer. Because what he charged himself of doing is, is learning the process of production. Uh, the way that he saw it, he was, he was gaining the knowledge under the workman's cap. Because for the most part, employers didn't really understand how their cigars were produced or how their steel was manufactured. They simply knew how to buy raw materials and, you know, negotiate tax deals with local governments, and they, they managed the business, right? What Taylor is going to ultimately come up with is this industrial philosophy known as scientific management. And the way that I want you to think about scientific management is to get your factories to run on a much more scientific basis, right? You want them to be meaner and leaner and more efficient. You want more bang for your buck. You want to crank out more stuff. Well, how do you do this? Again, it starts by learning the process of production. What Taylor would do is he would go behind, or he, he would let the guy know he was coming, but he said, I want you to roll me a cigar, right? I want you to take me from the first step right to the final step of producing a cigar. And he'd have a clipboard in one hand and a stopwatch in the other, and he'd tell the worker, go. And he would be taking copious notes while this guy, probably a little bit nerve-wracked considering the guy that's uh, running the factory is watching him. But anyway, he, he goes through every step of the production process. And what Taylor does when he's done is he goes up to his office and he works to shave seconds off of minutes, works to shave minutes off of hours, hours off of days. Is there a way that we can do this better? Is there a way that we can do it quicker without having to sacrifice any quality? Is there something we can do to, to make workers more productive? And if so, what can we do? That's what I mean when I say scientific management. And that traces its roots back to Frederick Winslow Taylor. The other guy there that you're looking at is a guy from the Detroit area, a man by the name of Henry Ford. What makes Ford famous is not the assembly line. That had been around for a long time before Ford. You might say that he perfected it, but still, it's definitely not the car. 
what made Henry Ford a household name and really enshrined him, if there was such a thing as a business hall of fame, it's, it's Fordism. Much like Frederick Winslow Taylor, it's this industrial philosophy that comes to kind of bear his name. What Fordism really was was two things. Number one, it involved cranking out an ungodly amount of production. At its height, the Ford River Rouge facilities in Dearborn, Michigan, was cranking out a new Model T Ford every 60 seconds, one new car per minute. That is, in, in, uh, is a, it's a staggering, staggering number. In any time you're producing like that, you're, you're really talking about bringing down the prices. Anytime you've got more of something, the price is going to come down. That's good. But what really defined Fordism was the practice of paying your workers enough to buy the stuff that they make. Pay them enough money so that they can buy the Ford Model Ts. Let's think about this. Who's more familiar with your product? Who would love to go out there and buy themselves a brand spanking new Ford Model T, right? Well, the Ford worker, of course. What was the problem of the Ford worker before 1914? It couldn't make enough, didn't make enough to buy those products. What Ford is going to introduce in 1914 has come to be known as the $5 day. Now, $5 doesn't seem like a whole lot of money to us, but that was a king's ransom for a working man back in, in the 19-teens and even into the 1920s. That was a very, very respectable paycheck. And so where else are you going to go to get $5 a day? What happens for Henry Ford is really two things. Number one, he taps into a completely unknown market. These are people that desperately wanted to buy the products that are being you know, marketed in the 1920s. They just didn't make enough money to do so. So he opened up an entirely new, and I also might add, massive market. Oldsmobile wasn't marketing its products to working men and women. They were marketing, I'm not making this up either, they were marketing it to the Queen of England, right? That, that's who drove an Oldsmobile. Henry Ford really, again, no pun intended, but reinvented the wheel when it comes to his marketing strategies. The other thing that happens is that labor turnover essentially ceases to exist at Ford. Again, if you're looking at those images there, uh, those Ford factories in Michigan, they, they look more like cities than they do factories, right? Hundreds of thousands of workers employed at the Rouge facility in Dearborn, okay? And so what that means for Henry Ford is he doesn't have to spend more money uh, recruiting workers because they don't like the job that they do and they feel like they're not being paid enough. Nobody quit at Ford because where else are you going to go to get $5 a day? And it also meant that he had the pick of the litter when it comes to the most productive, most capable workers, right? And so anyway, this is what is really going to make Ford uh, such an important person when it comes to the American economy, especially in the 1920s. As a matter of fact, you might say that Ford is really sort of the symbol of successful capitalism in the 1920s. I want to end our conversation talking about foreign policy and the simple fact of the matter is there, there's not a whole lot of foreign policy in the 1920s. As I said before, we're desperately trying to stay out of European affairs because we felt like we got burned in World War I. I mean, you'd have, to, you'd have to be an absolute idiot not to see that, you know, that at the end of World War I, you're just going to have to fight this same exact war 25 years down the road. And that's exactly what ended up happening. But when it comes to the economy, American corporations sold their products throughout the world. And as a result, we had an interest in making sure that those European markets and other markets throughout the globe were healthy, or at least healthy enough to buy our stuff. Problem was, they really weren't. And the problem was the Treaty of Versailles. If you remember anything about that last lecture, actually it was a couple lectures ago, but in any case, you'll know that because Germany was blamed for starting the war, they had to pay for the war. And that sent them into instantaneous economic depression. It's kind of what the French were driving at in the first place. The problem is that's dragging down the entire European market. Germany can't afford to pay back France, who now can't afford to buy our stuff. So along comes this guy, this investment banker turned congressman, a guy from Chicago by the name of Alan Dawes. 
And it's ultimately going to come to bear his name, the strategy that will employ the Dawes plan, not to be confused with the Dawes Act, but the Dawes plan. American bankers are going to loan Germany money, and Germany is going to take that money. They're going to use it to pay back the British and the French. The British and the French will use that money to pay back American bankers that they had uh, taken out money from, people like J.P. Morgan. They had borrowed heavily from during the war years, and they're also going to use that money to buy American-made products. And so if you're envisioning this, you, you, you get a little bit of a triangle thing going on, right? Money goes to the United States, it goes over to Germany, Germany sends it to France, France sends it back to the United States, and everybody lives happily ever after. It worked for a while, except by the late 1920s, Germany begins to default on those loans. They stop using the money to pay back the French and the British, and they use it to put roofs over their heads and food on their tables. But the problem is when the French aren't getting any of their money, it means that they can't pay back the Americans their money. They can't buy products from the United States. And it's going to drain the United States of its export market. If you know what I'm talking about here, this is going to be a causation of the Great Depression. Not the causation, but certainly a, a massive contributing factor, the drying up of our export market. But, as I said before, our foreign policy is really going to be defined by isolationism. Uh, when, when, when Warren Harding was campaigning in 1920, part of what he meant by his return to normalcy was a, a return to the time period when, when the United States didn't butt its nose into everybody else's, everybody else's opinion, everybody else's uh, business. You'll see a little bit more what I'm talking about um, once we get to the 1930s. But for right now, guys, that's where I hope to get. Uh, tune in next time for the culture of the 1920s.